Welcome to This Is Lit, a podcast where we get drunk and talk about books. <laughs> I'm Allison. And I'm Elizabeth, and welcome to a special honeymoon edition of This Is Lit. <laughs> All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the show. As you have noticed, I am joined by another lovely redheaded lady today. This is the wonderful Allison, who runs uh, the Story Eyed Book Reviews. And yes. Uh, she, yes, she has been on our podcast before when I was on maternity leave. Thank you for very, that. Very and, happy to be back. Yes. And so for anybody who doesn't know, I think you and I have been friends since we were 12, 12 13. 13 years yeah. old. So a, we've now been, a minute. now been in each other's lives more time than we've not been in each other's lives, which is weird. It's very weird. But <laughs> yes, it's very well. Mostly good. Yeah, mostly good. So, um, if you recall how things work, uh, what are you drinking today, Allie? Today, I'm drinking Angry Orchard Hard Cider. So, what are you drinking? I, in honor of the Hamilton premiere on Disney Plus in three days, for when this comes out, I am drinking Lafayette Sauvignon Blanc. Love it. It's St. Lafayette, which is appropriate. But um, for those of you who can't see, it's a twist up! <laughs> so it's delicious. Well, uh, cheers. Cheers. Clink. <laughs> so uh, this week, we read Sorcery of Thorns by Margaret Rogerson. Yes. We have the same lovely shiny cover, which um, I have it's to say, beautiful. it's gorgeous. Whoever did the cover art for this and her other book, uh, An Enchantment of Ravens, mwah. They're mwah. both beautiful. I love the colors. They're gorgeous. I love, um, like, usually on book covers, you get, like, the close-up face or you get, like, a far yeah, away kind I of thing. I love the juxtaposition. It's a really kind of fresh angle. Yeah. I just... And it's like... And I love that the focus is still, like, her eyes, even though they're not in the very center. Right. And, and the sword, so the very important sword. Oh, the sword. It really feels like Demon Slayer. that the cover is, like, a photograph of a moment from the book. And that's yes. what I love so much. And I know which moment it is. <laughs> so, it, yeah. It, yeah. There will be spoilers later, but right now we don't need to talk about it. But it's just, it's gorgeous. It is beautiful. Absolutely it's stunning. one of the, my favorite new books on my shelf. Yeah. And did you notice the eye on the back? I did. Cover? I didn't notice I, that until I finished the book and I closed it. And I'm like, oh my oh. gosh, there was a hint. <laughs> Still surprising you. Even I after know. It's done. Yeah. Yeah. And I think so, when I got this book, I spent like five whole minutes just looking at everything. Staring at the cover. Um, so did you end up, uh, you're obviously going to review it for the blog. Mm-hmm. Um, but did you get to do the... Um, like, I know sometimes you get advanced copies of books. Did you do that with this one? or? No. I did not, no. Um, by the time I started reaching out for things like this, this came out around the same time. But this was brand new, sparkly, shiny, around the time my blog started, which was about a year and a half ago. And um, I wanted to review it then, but it was hard to get a hold of for a while. All the libraries had yeah. sold out. And then... Um, I mean, if you're one of the only viewers who's never heard of this book, everyone's been talking about this book. Yeah, if you were immersed, if you were immersed in the book community, like even just like, I'm I'm kind of passive on like our just our Facebook book groups, but we have not found one bad review for this book. And normally there's like one or two. Normally there's like one or two or something that's like very critical. I just haven't found it, (laughs) and there's a good reason for that. Yeah, I I was worried for that. because I I had such high expectations, but most of them were met. I, I was very yeah. happy. And see, I came into this with no expectations. I have not read uh, even what's better. her first book, An Enchantment of Ravens, or anything you know, like that. I actually haven't either, and that one got more mixed reviews. Yeah, um, but then this one's just been like blowing up. So yeah, so this is I a was second so book. Curious. Yeah, and I think she's definitely found her stride. Oh yeah, definitely. She's she's found she's found it. Um, and also too, this book gets extra points with me because the main character's name is Elizabeth. Yes, in it's fact, close. when I recommended this book 
for the episode. Yes, Allie I said, it. it's about a girl named Elizabeth who's brunette and grows up in a library. And uh, you were sold. That's all I you was. needed to hear. You didn't even need to hear about the plot. Clearly, she's <laughs> slightly prettier than I am. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> but it is a good poll, especially given she's yeah. kind of your book twin. And she really is. <laughs> Duty like unto death. <laughs> Hufflepuffs. Woohoo. Uh, speaking of, let's uh, to uh, quote the girls from uh, That's Why We Drink, let's crack into it. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. So the book starts off with Elizabeth in what is called the Great Library. There's several great libraries, but they yeah. all hold grimoires or books of magic. Yes. And what I thought was interesting in this world was that grimoires are not just books you can take off the shelf and open and read no. and they provide information. They are sentient, living, magical beings, yeah, which is why these librarians have to be almost like warrior like yes they have to be librarians but they also have to be skilled in combat um and the book starts off with they are transporting a particularly dangerous grimoire known as the book of eyes which is they're all classified by levels one being the most harmless and level tens being the most dangerous books but the reason plus yeah yeah and the reason they don't destroy these books is because most of them are they're rare because the spells one of the things that I really liked about the grimoire mythology that they started off with is that since magic is such a powerful thing and the spells are so powerful and they come from the other world where demons are, uh, something slightly more than earth can be able to bind them. So ink and paper just can't bind these spells. There has to be right. something else. It requires kind of a living part to be able to even be written down. And I use that in like a loose term. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're also kept because one, another facet I found was interesting was that in this world, magic, the use of magic, if you're a person is very dependent on these very, very, very old families. So it's yes. very limited as to who can use it, but it's also very dangerous. So these are kept for the simple fact that they are sort of the only resources left available that aren't yeah. controlled by these old families. I don't know. It's an interesting. It's a glimpse. And Elizabeth, who has grown up in the library, in the great library at Summerhall. Since she was a toddler. Yes. She was left on the doorstep in the middle of the night. And the director at the time, who was a woman, brought her in. And she grew up in the library amongst mm -hmm. the stacks and these grimoires and which is a little unusual because they yeah. say most of them come around most of the apprentices 13, come 14. around 13 right so she's a little younger than the others yeah she's but a little she younger. grows up there yeah and the book starts off when she's 16 and she is helping the director uh transport the book of eyes to the vault which uh the book of eyes can speak to her. Among other things. Um, yes, among other things. The Book of Minds includes, um, you know, part of its spells are mind control. And and because it's written down in the book, this being knows it. it it's yeah. a very fascinating, very original. Yes, I can say I, I love... I love the magic systems she came up with in this yeah, book. Yeah, that's what immediately it, it drew pulls me in. on a lot of the old mythology, but it also uses it Very in such a new so. way. Mm -hmm. I, I'm in love with it. Um, right. But we Same. also learn in this first chapter. We also learn about Elizabeth's admiration for the director, her love for the director, who raised her since she was a child, and she's like, "This is my chance to prove that I can become a warden to the library." Right. And um, very important to her. Yeah, it is. It's been her life's dream to be a warden of the library. Um, and so we also learn about some of the things that can counteract magic. Iron, salt. Uh, Which are very classic. Yeah. But I liked the way that they used them. Yeah, me too. It was sort of creative. Um, yet again, just another proof of her doing a good job of taking tradition and making it a little bit different. Yeah, and I will say, I will say with this book, like the first six to eight chapters with me seemed really, really slow. But then when everything started falling into place, I realized 
everything was like meticulously chosen and there was no fat to trim with this book really yeah. everything that needed to be in it was in it in it and everything that didn't need to be in it wasn't in it i agree and i'll also say this might have just been me mm -hmm. but in the beginning before i got to know elizabeth well mm -hmm. i was a little hesitant with her character because i felt like this was going to become kind of the cliched secret chosen power secret powers. chosen kid and yeah. i just was like oh, okay we'll see where this goes yeah but, and so that made it kind of drag a little bit just because i'm yeah. not sure who she was as a person now i don't feel that way now that i've finished the book i, I think the book um, starts off too where elizabeth is so certain of who she is or who right. she wants to be but she's not there yet it gives you this interesting like false first impression it does of the first character which i enjoy now that i'm at the end <laughs> yes now that we're at the end um but yeah and so we just have this introductory chapter and we're like oh that was interesting that was a good like i originally thought it was like a good way to introduce the magic system and introduce the world and introduce the character and now i realize it's important to the plot it's mm -hmm. one of those things where it was like Supernatural's first five minutes of the pilot carried the season, carried the arc for five seasons. The first five pages of this book carry the plot. <laughs> uh, pretty Almost. much. Yeah. Um, and so then we also learn uh, about Elizabeth's prejudice towards sorcerers. Yes, which is not just her issue. In no, fact, it's the library. The library <laughs> well, they, because they guard these books full of dangerous magic over the centuries of the libraries being in use there's just this feeling towards sorcerers people who use magic has developed where it's just sort of like if you're doing that you're irresponsible you shouldn't be magic yeah, shouldn't should be, be kept safe away that's because dangerous and dark there's a lot well, of they fear explain, and hate. they explain with sorcerers a major source of their magic is their connection with the family demon that has been summoned. <laughs> right. Which I really loved because Oh yeah. I don't know um how much like if, if you if you have as readers have read like the Sabriel series or the the His Dark Materials series, both mm -hmm. of those magic systems are similar in the fact in the way they use demons. And yeah. I love that she brought this back in a very unique way. Yeah, we haven't read Sabriel on the podcast, but I would like to because it's been forever since I've read that. And uh, Casey and Karina, time. Casey and Karina read uh, The Golden Compass when I was on maternity leave. I remember that. So yeah, <laughs> throwing it back to six months ago. Yeah. So <laughs> you know some influences. <laughs> yeah, some influences, but um, yeah, and the next major plot point i suppose that happens is they get a visit from a magister who which is another yes. word for sorcerer in this book or a uh, very uh magister is a pretty big deal sorcerer they're like oh, yes essentially that means that they are the head of their family yes the head of their um, household right and they're important in politics and government and the whole thing but mm -hmm. essentially it means they're the head of their family and this one is interesting yeah it's almost like being nobility just about yes. and he essentially yeah he as soon as he made an appearance i'm like an inter hot sorcerer love interest <laughs> inter hot sorcerer bad boy with a heart of gold like i mean yeah <laughs> i was worried about him too it was cliche after cliche and yeah the way she ends up using them like i can't even be mad now yeah but i was at first <laughs> i know it, it starts off as every because, young adult cliche novel because she right, made, because it, she knocks over a bouquet uh, yeah and, and I, she's spying on him like it was a great meet cute though because knocking over a bookcase is like i don't know that's just adorable to me um and i immediately i always have a soft spot for bad boys no matter how cliche they I are know, so. i know or like the disgraced prince kind of cliche right you know Those are like my two weeks like <laughs> not accepted and dark inside but secretly cares like their own demons <laughs> and is scared to care about people in fear of getting hurt right again. <laughs> so if you like that kind of character this yeah. is the book for you, well, if you new like, book boyfriend if, oh <laughs> Yeah, new book boyfriend for sure in this house. And the way um, they describe him, 
I know with the shock of white hair and the dark curliness, I'm like, I am yeah. in. I'm and you know in. what I also liked? Just a quick note for everyone. Yeah. The shock of hair actually had a point. I know. <laughs> Again, there was nothing in this oh. book that didn't need to be there. Right. Like there were so many times I wanted to kind of call her out for a trope or I would, or I would, you know, think, well, really, that's the choice you chose. And yet then she would turn it around and use it in some creative way. And every single time I ate my words. So, yeah, because this book is full of tropes, but the tropes are done well and the tropes have a purpose. Yes. Yes. For interesting, None of them were like, just there to be there. Yeah. For, uh, for instance, Elizabeth, it is stated very early that she is very tall for a girl. Mm -hmm. Which She's, I liked. Yeah. Usually I protagonists are like short and petite yeah <laughs> and i was a tall girl <laughs> i'm a big fan <laughs> i know i wasn't a tall girl till much later in life <laughs> hey but the struggle is still real the struggle is still real trying to find pants <laughs> is impossible right um, i love that in the book she has dresses lengthened multiple times like, they're too short they're too short they're too short <laughs> and it happens more than once it's i know just, it's that so was great. i love that <laughs> And that's like a little detail that you wouldn't understand if you weren't an average height person. Right, exactly. Yeah. Because you knew me like, one. you knew me like in high school when it's like I had like a two to three, like I had a two year period where I grew six inches. Yeah. <laughs> and you knew like the struggle. <laughs> I did because that was me at 12. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't do it till I was like 16. Um, <laughs> hey, I mean, good on you for waiting. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I had no control over it. Um, but yeah, enter hot sorcerer boyfriend. Yes. And but, she's essentially just like, well, she's not really supposed to interact with him. No, she's not because she's a lowly apprentice. She's not supposed right. to be anywhere near a sorcerer of his caliber. But she ends up interacting him with him because of aforementioned bookcase falling yes, on top of that. Falling on it's top of that. Very, very cute. And her best girlfriend's Katrin. That's what it is. Katrin. Because it reminded me of Katra from She Ra. Yeah. Same. Okay, so yeah, who Elizabeth. is fourteen? Mm -hmm. And for the first few chapters of the book, I thought Elizabeth was fourteen, mm -hmm. and that changed a lot of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the book was better when uh, I sorted that out. Yes, her BFF Catherine is hiding behind the next book stack of books, and she's like, "Grab his hair to see if he has horns." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just do it. <laughs> that was funny. Because <laughs> she's very. For science. Yes. And, and also very unashamed. Dismantle of... the patriarchy. <laughs> right. And I, you know, wouldn't be embarrassed by that at all. No, no. no. That's a good girlfriend to have. You always <gasps> need one of those girlfriends. Yes. <laughs> she's like, it's only slightly against the rules. There's no rule that says we shouldn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Katrin is a wonderful influence on Elizabeth. Um, but she talks to him and she's like, there's this strange smell on this chair over here. What is it? And he's like, oh, it's this, the smell comes from this atmospheric interference when we pull magic from the other world. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, ethereal combustion. Yes. Ethereal combustion. Which I love because it sounds yes. scientific and I feel like I know exactly what it means just from what exactly. it says. I love it's, that. It's the warp core. <laughs> in writing um and then the next thing that happens is elizabeth wakes up in the middle of the night and she's like so something's nagging her that something is wrong right she's not sure what but she wakes up and and the creepiest thing is that no one else, no one is, else awake. is awake and she tries Even the to wake warden's up on duty yeah yeah their warden should be on duty she knows the rules of this place, like the back of her hand. Mm -hmm. And she's like, nothing is right here. And she finds the director dead in the entryway with the front doors of the library banging open. And so she picks up the director's sword, which is a famous sword, Demon Slayer, mm -hmm. and goes after a grimoire that has basically gone postal. What they called a... It was a malefic... Malefic, yes. Um, not sure if that's exactly right. Something close to that, if you're looking. But um, 
Yeah, essentially. So one of the reasons why grimoires are kept in libraries is because after a certain age, they become very temperamental. Um, like for instance, if you spill something on them or drop them or tear them, the magic in them can become unstable, essentially causing these sentient books to become what are basically monsters. Yes, um, they do. And they destroy towns, take lives. And uh, yes. Maleficht. Maleficht. Oh, we're M-A-L-E-F-I-C-T, on yeah. <laughs> So, yes, books become very temperamental, and if something happens to them, they become monsters called malefics. And they ravage towns, destroy right. people. So she They're wakes up in life. the middle of the night. No one is awake. She finds yeah. the director dead, and she notices that the Book of Eyes, actually, which is this super powerful uh, mal- it's, or grimoire. It's a it's medium one of the most, powerful. Yeah, it's one of the most powerful she's ever encountered. I think it's like a five or six. Right, but that's a big deal in this world. Yeah. Um, that is the one that has been transformed, and it is heading towards the town. And so she has to make a choice. Take up the director's sword and fight it, stall for time, so that way it doesn't get to the village and hurt people, or run up and ring the alarm bell. And she realizes... If I run up and ring the alarm bell, the town won't have time to evacuate. And the, right, the monster will get to the town yeah. before they hear it. And the motto of the librarians is duty unto death. And so that has been like her mantra for life. So she's like, I don't have to kill it. I just have to stall it. And so she picks up Demon Slayer and goes after the thing. I liked that she was willing to do it, but she yeah. didn't act like she was just going to go kick its ass because... No. That is the appropriate confidence level to have as a 16-year-old yeah. girl picking She's up like, a sword. I've never done this before. I've never right. wielded a sword before. Um, I'm probably not going to win this fight, but I will consider it a win if I stall it long enough for the people who can handle it to get here. Yeah. Um, it also kind of tells you a little bit about her, I guess, Boy Scout syndrome, <laughs> where she's like, nope. We're good. We're, we're protecting everybody else. I don't care what I have to do. Yeah. Well, uh, she's been an orphan her whole life. So yeah. she's not used to getting help. No. And that's not really the culture of the library either. They're no, it's much not. Like the li- and the library, the library has been her home and this mantra has been drilled into her. And she wants, she's always wanted to be someone who protects the library and the people. And so she's like, okay, let's do it. Let's go. And um, as you can imagine, a uh, fight goes poorly for her, but she does kill it. Yep. But it does offer, it's like, do you want to know who killed the director? She's like, I can't listen to it because the Book of Eyes lies. Mm-hmm. But that seed is planted because she knows that the director would not have her sword out if, and this grimoire would not have basically gone postal unless something triggered right. they don't just go postal for no reason exactly and she's they like there's too much strangeness going on reason. and so she wakes up from the battle and finds out she has been imprisoned because the new director who has hated her her entire life is pinning this entire crime on her and well she was also like what found with the sword she was the only one awake she was the yeah. only one found out of bed except for the dead director so yeah. like he does hate her, but he also has a couple reasons to think she might have killed some people. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. <laughs> it's a bad it's, situation for my, Elizabeth. Yeah, my point is he's just, he won't even listen to her story of what happened. And oh, no. she's yeah, like, I smelled true. ethereal combustion. He's like, how do you know about that? And so he thinks she has been consorting with demons and sorcerers and she's an inside spy and blah, 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 blah. And everybody is like, she is 16. Everyone knows that she has fought her whole life to become a warden. She loved the director. There is no reason for her to do this. Like, everyone's like, yeah, the evidence is there, but there's no motivation. Yeah, I liked that at least most of the people there were on her side. And if you work murder mysteries, you have to know you have to have opportunity and motivation to be the culprit. 
Well, I mean, technically you don't have to. It's just more likely. Yeah. <laughs> Usually in murder, there's some kind of motivation, even if it's internally driven. Um, Usually. Yeah. yeah. I, I will tell <laughs> your lead on that. I read fictional crime stories. You read real ones, um, <laughs> which are far, far scarier. Oh. Um, but, but yeah, um, so they're like, yeah, yeah so council sorcerers are going to come pick you up. Yeah. And guess who picks her up? <laughs> The magistrate that she met uh, the day before. Yeah. And we discovered the, uh, his name is Nathaniel young Thorne. Young bad boy yes. magistrate. Um, he is... The city's most gives... eligible bachelor. <laughs> well, we don't know that yet. But no. Yes. But he but, likes um, to brag he about He gives it. the reason that he was nearby as the reason mm -hmm. that he came to pick her up. Even though then she finds out he volunteered. Yes. You're right. either way... Yes. He takes her away from the library because they basically disown her. Yeah, so there's the three-day carriage ride. And she also meets his manservant, Silas, which in this house we stand Silas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, he's a complicated character. He is very soft-spoken and mysterious. And she thinks she sees things and then thinks she's wrong and she doesn't yeah. know what to think about Silas. And that's And she has moments where she's like, no, don't knows. trust Silas. And then she has moments where she completely trusts Silas. Right. We are very, very quickly set up to understand that we know nothing about him. Yes. But we are also set up very quickly to understand that he and Nathaniel have a very familiar relationship, especially with their banter on the carriage. Yes. Not only are they you know, like master and manservant, but like they're very, very clearly close as friends or family. As soon as they get to the city, um, they are attacked by uh, these fiends. Fiends, demonic which are fiends. Which essentially, yeah. Um, they're like imps, they're low class demons. Right. Even demons have that a were, class system. Right. And, and they were summoned by someone. Yeah. They have to be. But and they don't know they who. They have to be. And they say a lot of people who are trying to break into the old families to prove that, like, they're sorcerers and all that stuff summon fiends. And, like, the noble houses won't even deal with it because it's not even worth their time. Right. It's, it's the relation between demons and humans is almost very classist. It is. Um, so well, it's, um, it's a big yeah. question mark as to where these imps came from. Yeah. And why... They decided to ta attack Elizabeth, especially when she has a sorcerer bodyguard. Right. And during the fight, yeah, that's a good point to add, is that it, it becomes very clear they're not after them as a group. They're, they're after, after Elizabeth. As an individual. Yeah. And there is a romping good fight through the streets. It was a pretty good scene. Yeah. 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 She got a crowbar. I thought they were done for. <laughs> Yeah, you did. There. <laughs> you did. <laughs> well, not seriously, because there was like a lot more of the book to go. But yeah, it looked real bad for a minute. Hot sorcerer boyfriend dies in the first two chapters. <laughs> um, Twist. Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> whatever. Um, <laughs> hey, people have done it. That's all. I I'm know. Saying. I know. <laughs> so um, um, yeah, they survive, and the next day she meets the head of the council, Lord Ashcroft. Yes, yes. The collegiate, I yes. think they call him. Ash Ashcroft. We can just Ashcroft. refer to him as that. Mm -hmm. um, she meets him, and he is almost immediately very much like, He's I'm so sorry they arrested you. We were this wrong. This is ridiculous. Yeah, we were wrong because after that whole fight through the streets, clearly somebody wants you dead. Right. Because Plus, you're the only witness. Plus, in the time that she was in the carriage, another library has been attacked. Yeah. So those two things. There are things... five libraries in this kingdom, with the sixth being the one in the middle, which is the royal library. Yes. And um, so with so now... the obvious attempt yeah. on her life, and then um, the fact that another library was attacked. While she was uh, still in custody. Right. Ashcroft is just like so sorry about that um please don't hate me and tell everyone about it yeah oh my mistake there are five royal libraries and the fifth one is in the center 
So gotcha. there's five in total, including the Royal Library. I've got this book comes with a handy dandy map. It does. It's so pretty. It is such a pretty map. I, I'm a sucker for good book maps. Me too. I really am. They're not included nearly as often as they used to be. And I really I miss know. that. I know. Because I love a good book map. Yes. But so we also Brass grew Bridge. up in the height of book maps. <laughs> yeah. So, yes. I um, was trying to be Tolkien when we were growing up, but it was great. That's true. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so another library's been attacked, and he essentially says that they're just going to forget all of this and that yeah. he's going to help her get her job back. Please and that be a guest in my house. I will help you have your job back. And Nathaniel will leave her with me. And that was the moment I'm like, mm. Yeah, it was just too easy. Because all of a it sudden was. I was like, okay, easy. either the book is over or this is bullshit. Like, that was the moment I'm like, it's either him or he's involved. Right. And or, well, I mean, part of, I had a third option, which like, he could have just been like a slimy politician in that moment anyway. Later on, I, that wasn't an because excuse. But in the beginning, we know so little. Yeah, Elizabeth has to learn to also deal with the papers, which is something she's never had to worry about before, mm -hmm. about how Ashcroft is seen by the papers and in society and Nathaniel. And um, it's very strange to her because there's like a ball the next day and she's dressed up all pretty, but she's horribly awkward because she doesn't know anything, a ball in Ashcroft's house. Right. There's this very, um, almost a high society of magic users, yes. um, sorcerers, because like we said, like, sorcerer families tend to be old and wealthy like there is almost yeah. like this higher class yeah and now he's um, parading elizabeth around all these social norms yes and yeah. she doesn't know yeah. any of them yeah and now he's parading elizabeth around because they found out you know the street fight happened she's being hailed as a hero right and the so the newspapers like, i have the hero apprentice here in my house but he puts her out and around these people to make her be awkward and to make it look like she's a bit of an oddball in society yeah. because he's like oh we're gonna have a ball don't worry about it she's like uh okay right and then she meets his demon lucinda i was just gonna say she is something she is very much more direct about what mm -hmm. they want and don't want from her. Um, and that's, I think, the first, like, real concrete moment where you're like, okay, here's mm -hmm. the proof that he's not on her side. Exactly. And she basically puts her under some sort of spell, but it doesn't fully take. Right. She even is... notes that she's resisting her, which yeah, the prizes. Her. Which, this is the second time we get where Elizabeth's response to magic is not necessarily the norm. Mm -hmm. Everyone's like, this is an odd, she's an odd duck. <laughs> um, right. And the first time was that she woke up during what they later yeah. conceived to be a massive sleeping spell. Yeah. Um, so she shouldn't have been awake. So yeah, this is the second time we have that thought. And we realize it might be something more significant. Yeah. Because, but she plays along because she knows that is her best chance for survival. She doesn't right. want them to know that she is still fully awake, even though her body isn't. Right. So they essentially, like, magically drug her into yeah. paralysis and what should be unconsciousness, but she's not unconscious. Yeah. And so then Ashcroft tries to rifle through her mind to find out what she has been keeping from him. So, yeah, uh, she is pretending to be paralyzed and unconscious. And then not only does he rifle through her brain, but he int he um, goes on to have a very incriminating conversation Horribly. with his demon right there in the room. Because he thinks um, she can't hear him. Exactly. But it's it's one of those moments where as a book reader, you're like, oh, my God, almost everything gets laid out in front of you in a surprise moment. Like, yeah. Well, what you think is almost everything, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's shocking to us and Elizabeth. Well, the moment that it happened, I'm like, I knew it. I knew he was slimy. Um, <laughs> yeah. I felt the same way. <laughs> yeah. And then, like, when she wakes up, she's like, 
uh, and they're like, oh, you swooned. Right. Don't worry about it. We'll call the doctor You're tomorrow. Fine. And then the doctor comes. And she pretends not to know anything. Yeah, the doctor comes, talks to her for two minutes. He's like, she's insane. You should send her to a hospital. Right, and she tells the doctor. She does. She tries. Hey, this is what's going on. Ashcroft is doing all of this. He's waking up grimoires. He's doing all this magic. And she sounds like a lunatic. And he's or at like, least the doctor thinks so. Yeah. And so he has her basically declared insane and tries and to send, send her, her to this. Yeah. To this hospital. Hospital ward place. Yeah. Which lead is, water or something like that. Which is and it's just terrible. Horrible. Which, how has that, like, not been the story for most women in society. Yeah. Especially like leading up to like that. the 20th century where it's like, oh, they're just down with the hysterics and into a hospital. Right. And <laughs> I kind of liked that, especially because later on in the story, um, this is something that happens in Outlander too. And I think oh. I, it's just always been one of my favorite tropes is when a character is massively disbelieved and then mm-hmm. later, Nathaniel has the opportunity to believe or disbelieve her, and he believes her. And yeah. I think so many more stories now are focusing on believing women being an attractive quality, being a, a yeah. quality of good, because we I should believe women. We Hashtag should believe women. <laughs> yes, we should always believe women. Um, but Especially just... if they're women of color or minorities. Right, but I, I just loved that she used this opportunity not only to show what what kind of man Nathaniel was, Mm -hmm. but also to show like how much that means to a person. Yeah. When you say something and no matter what it is, they believe you. Yeah. Because that was a a moment of intimacy that I liked. Yeah. Because she escapes with the help of this girl named Mercy, who clearly has nothing wrong with her. Right. She's in this hospital. And, So, like, she escapes, and then she tries to send a letter back to Summer Hall, her library, to tell them what's going on. And they're like, we have no record of you. Yeah. We don't know who you are. And she's like, are you kidding me? I lived there for 16 years of my life. And so she ends up finding Silas and following him home. (laughs) Right. Because she's like, I have nowhere else to go. Mm -hmm. And she finds Silas and Nathaniel again. And, um, yeah, I think that was honestly one of my favorite parts in the book was that she walked in the door and both of those men took her at her word. Yeah. They're like, like, there wasn't any drama about it. Yeah. They're also like, especially in a YA book, you never know. I loved it so much. It was so nice. That was probably the most attractive moment for me and Nathaniel. Yeah. (laughs) Because it's like, well, she has no motivation to lie about it. But and we all I mean, know Ashcroft's slime, so yeah. So that was a satisfying moment. But it was, they it was um, satisfying. But and at first, he, Nathaniel says, "You can stay here, but I'm not going to help you no. because that's suicide. Suicide, politically, physically, spiritually, in all yeah. ways." And she's like, "Fine, luck. I'll do it myself." Right. And and she does. Because she, yeah, she does it herself. And so she just, like, starts going through grimoire after grimoire after grimoire in his library, trying to find something about what Ashcroft is doing. Because she also knows that she just, she needs, clearly nobody believes her besides Nathaniel and Silas. What she needs to do is she needs to find some physical proof of what Ashcroft is doing. Because she knows the director's death is his fault. Exactly. And not only that now, but what, three libraries now have been yes. which and, are her um, home. She needs to bring this man to justice. And all the directors have been killed, plus multiple wardens. I mean, it's it's becoming yeah. a, a big massacre of essentially where her home. Yeah. She I mean, cares this, very deeply about this That's continuing. something that I really liked about this book, is that it started off as just kind of like one character and their mission – and they're protecting of one place, which is their home. And it slowly grew into uh, protecting and, in, you know, protecting much, much more than that. And she I love never that questioned too. it. 
Right. She never and I went also, back and was like, well, I don't care about the other libraries. I care about my library. She's like, no, right. I care about all libraries and everybody. The whole culture as a whole, and even just the principles behind it, duty and knowledge being power, yes. you know, it was almost like the Matilda of my dreams, like yes. that culture a little bit. Like, um, but I also think that was a great way for the writer to choose to introduce the larger world yeah. going from a small scope of one library and the inner workings of it and the different people and types of things in the world to then just expanding on that as they move farther out into the world. That was well done in the writing. Yeah. That was well planned. Yeah, that was, it was very well planned and I very much enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. um, and then it also like, as she began to learn more and more about it, you as the reader cared more and more and more about this wider world because that was what it was what was at stake. And she cared about Definitely. it too, because it doesn't like there was a there's a podcast I listened to where uh, one of the characters who is a sorcerer and his two other traveling companions. His two other traveling companions are very we have to save the world, and he's very much I have to save my group. The rest of the world can burn, but this is my group. But he ended up sticking with them to save mm -hmm. the rest of the world because that's where they were going. Yeah, <laughs> and so I'm like I I like that. It just didn't stay, I have to save my group, and consequently through that I have to save the world. It's very much, I have to save the world because I'm the only one who can right now. Right. You know, <laughs> she mentions multiple times, like, I even loved this because it was very smart. And oftentimes in, and especially YA, though I don't want to pick mm -hmm. on YA, but a lot of times, like, they'll, like, not think of simple things. Like, she mentions more than once that she didn't want to die being the only one who knew this stuff. So she yeah. purposely tells other people like yeah. there wasn't any of this like secrecy to be dramatic. Whoa. Like she, she didn't keep anything. She knew a secret. the score with Ashcroft no. and she knew the stakes and she never took it anything but seriously. No. And I and really she liked that. Everybody. Right. Anyone she could get in front of, she told. Right. So she, and she still the game. only people who believe her are Nathaniel and Silas. Right. So she's staying with them. Mm -hmm. And um, here is where I guess our second glimpse of the other side of this world starts to happen, which is when we start seeing more of Nathaniel's daily life. Yes. Um, and more of his personality, because now that she's in his home, she's seeing more vulnerable moments, mm -hmm. um, namely that he has nightmares he can't control about horrible, horrible things that have happened with his which family. Which is why he doesn't want anybody in the house with him. And then she realizes that Silas is Nathaniel's demon. <laughs> right. That they have this bargain that's been passed down through mm -hmm. Nathaniel's entire family, and who's demons. known for necromancy, yeah. his necromancy. Is. Um, they're very old and they've um, enlisted the services of this specific demon over and over and over again yeah. through the generations. And that's where the whole old nobility thing kind of comes into is because these demons' names are passed down generation to generation to generation. And through those generations, it kind of makes the demon a lot stronger um, because it gets more lives through the bargain because demons are interested in human life. That's what they trade on and so like if you don't have an old powerful demon to summon i think she says it takes like two or three generations before the sorcery people will even take you seriously right or she said like even if um some dabbler or criminal gets a hold of a high-powered demon's name yeah they had they have to keep that demon in the family for multiple generations before they're taken seriously by high yeah. society so, um, so it's very interesting, and given that we know Silas is powerful, but we don't know how figure powerful. things out. Um, we also know Silas is very fashionable. <laughs> yes, and makes fun of his master for not being able to tie his shoes without magic. <laughs> yeah, uh, but we also find out that Silas killed Nathaniel's father. Right. Well, we find out a lot. Yeah. And we don't get any explanation no, we don't for get what any actually answers. happened yet. But we find out that, yeah, um, he killed his father. Mm -hmm. And and he's the last of his lines, which is why he has the magic. Nathaniel knows title. about it. And he's only 18. Mm -hmm. 
which I do wish they'd have both been a little bit older, but that's yeah. just me. Maybe like 17 and 20 or something like that, but that's me and I'm old. So, yeah, I just would have liked to add two years minimum to each of their ages. Yeah. But again, I know it's YA, so that's just me. I'm not going to hold that against it, the book. It's not... And it didn't take away anything from the no, book, it really. Didn't. I just thought that, like, both of them were I acting think... older than they were. And I get that yeah. they can, like, be more mature, but it didn't I feel as natural to me. I think the only thing separating this from being a YA, for, the only thing making this a YA book versus an adult book is, one, the main characters in love interests age. Two, we're probably missing a sex scene. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think they kiss Other than that, once. this could, yeah. But then again, I wonder if... So I don't know if there's going to be a sequel of this book. So I was I researching know. and I, the author either hasn't announced it or she's not sure yet. But yeah. I will say the ending sets it up like it sounds like, like there's going to be, be a, a sequel, sequel. But it's also a very satisfying ending because where do you go after the ending of this book? I don't know, though. How but do you raise the stakes? Well, maybe you take the same world and do something else. I yeah. don't know. But the ending to me felt like she was building up to a sequel. But we can get to it that later. Be. Yeah, it could be. Um, but, yeah, so she is staying with Nathaniel. And mm-hmm. I like that during the kind of lull that you usually get in action when someone's, like, gathering information, as Elizabeth is doing, we're mm-hmm. also learning about Na- Nathaniel. And mm-hmm. so it doesn't get boring. No. and it keeps she also, going. She also finds the scrying mirror. Yes, she finds this weird little mirror yeah. And she's able to contact her friend back at school, Catherine. Yeah, which reminded me very much of, like, a Beauty and the Beast kind of a thing. Which, you know, I'm a sucker for that fairy tale. Oh, yeah. And that's funny. It reminded me of that mirror in Harry Potter with Sirius. Oh, the mirror Super. of the uh, Right. Oh, oh, like, oh, oh, the communication mirror. Right. But if, like, those two had a baby, yeah. that would be that mirror. <laughs> yeah. Because she was flipping through society, and she's like, I wish I could see Catrin. And then there, there was Catrin. She's like, you're in the mirror over the bed. Oh, my gosh, I can talk to you. How does this work? No, wait, never mind. I have so right. much to tell you. <laughs> but it's also kind of a moment of conflict for her because, A, this will help her in her strategy. B, she misses her friend in her home. Yeah. But, C, as an apprentice of the library and someone who's been raised to believe He's in their ideals. to be using magic. That's what kind. I was going to say. Yeah. Exactly. But... With the motto of duty unto death, it's very much a, you do what you have to. You do what you have to do. And for her, she's like, if that means using magic in order to save everybody, I will do it. Even if it's against right. everything hot. And plus, I like that, like, it was a conflict, but it wasn't, like, a big dramatic moment. Because, no. like, really, there wasn't anything else to do. No. In this moment. Really and that's bad. very made... It's made very clear because the plot in this book is so clean. It is. Like. It's so clean. Yeah. Ugh, I wish I could do that. Um, without taking, without taking, I don't know how many years to do it. Oh, well, that's just, that's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Plot is just, uh, mwah. um, but yeah, so she talks to Katrin and, uh, Katrin is like, hey, so I'm working on a thing to bring them the bring down the director here because he's atrocious. But in the middle of my little rebellion, I think I can help you save the world. <laughs> right. She offers to get her very, very much needed information yes. about where a book is in the Royal Library that yes. Ashcroft is trying to get a hold of so that she can get a copy and find out what Ashcroft is looking for. Yes. And uh, Catherine is like, oh, yeah, it's here in the Royal Library. So, um, you know, you just need access. So just she a gets job. a job at the Royal Library. And she's like, they're not going to let not- a maid look at it. And she's like, you don't have to ask to take it. Well, see, that's just the saying. whole, um, <laughs> that's the twist, I think. Yeah. Is that she has to go and get a job at this library, not as an apprentice, which she once was. Yeah. But as like a maid, a maid. Just, like helps change the fireplace and keeps things running, which she doesn't act like that's beneath her or anything. No, but the whole point is that she's used to this access and now she's going to have to kind of 
be crafty and illegal yeah, to get gonna, it, and she's never she's done that. She's going to have to break her, basically break her vows as a librarian and steal a book. Or is she keeping her vows? That's true. It's one That's of those, the like, am I breaking my vows by stealing this book, or am I keeping them to keep everybody safe by taking the book? And I think that that is a main point of the book. Yeah. Is that sometimes you have to or rethink. Or sometimes it's both. Yeah, or sometimes you have to rethink the idea of your vows to get the right thing done. It, it's very much kind of in that line of, like, the fairy tale trope. It's, like, in, in a lot of, like, old fairy tales, especially grim fairy tales, there is there's not necessarily a sense of right and wrong. There is what is appropriate in your situation. And you can only really do the best you can in your situation. I would say, yeah, though, she definitely has a tighter moral compass than grim fairy oh yeah <laughs> yeah definitely <laughs> tighter she, moral compass on top of duty <laughs> until death she has a very clear cut narrow moral focus which is That's very true. central to her character which um, her, she believes her duty is the protection and the continued existence of the library and the protection and the continued existence of the kingdom at large right. which is what she believes her duty is so she's like you know what as long as that doesn't go against my duty then I'll do it. <laughs> yep. So she's staying with Nathaniel. Steals she's the book. Learning a lot about him. She she gets Silas to help her steal the book. <laughs> yeah. Because he can also transform into a white fluffy cat. <laughs> so she gets a job at the library, and yeah, yeah, she takes Silas with her, and they sneak into the restricted restricted section mm. of the library. The infamous restricted section. <laughs> Right. And I love that scene personally, the way she writes about, you know, she's going into the restriction section of this mm -hmm. library and it's full of these books, which, you know, like we've said, yeah. are alive beings who want to be read and used. Yeah. And, taken and they off haven't the seen anybody like Elizabeth right. before and they all talk to her. Or they haven't seen anybody in years, period. Yeah. And They're so like, hello, just, dear. <laughs> the, the scene where way. she goes into the restricted library, um, I thought was very, very interesting. Oh, so good. And she did a really good job of, you know, giving that atmospheric, eerie feeling that good moments in books do. Um, yeah. It was very well done. It was very, very eerie, even though she was like, I should be comfortable amongst these books because I've been around books my whole life. Right. She, it, even at the beginning, it says that she came across a book that wasn't a magic book. It wasn't a grimoire. And she thought it was dead. Yeah. <laughs> she thought the book was dead because it didn't react to her. She's yeah. like, this is strange. <laughs> yeah. But I'm um, here in this restricted section. We meet a few new book faces briefly yeah, book faces um yeah. but she finds out that there's just a plethora of things there and she finds the book she's looking for that ashcroft is looking for yes which barely reacts to her at all because it hasn't been pulled off the shelf in probably a century yeah and there's something like there aren't many copies of the of it left there's only two one mysteriously disappeared which is now an ashcroft, ashcroft study has it yeah. And then the second one is in the vault now of the Royal Library. Now in her hands, yeah. Yeah, now in her hands, formally in the vault of the Royal Library. And, uh, you know, it's almost like the books help her get out with it. Yeah. They Especially want since her to take it and they read do. it. They're like, and to come it. back and get oh. more. Yeah. I mean, I really liked the way she used that environment. Yes, I love it. It, it was oh, it was so it was very page master that movie or yeah page master or um ink spell remember that book oh yeah kind of yeah but yeah yeah i just love books about books <laughs> i know i love books about books too <laughs> especially magical books that like to talk to you <laughs> right so she gets this book out of um the library she takes it home and this the thing about this book, tried, the reason yeah. ashcroft wants it is that there's purportedly some hidden cipher inside from the man who wrote yeah, it there's that is very important to the foundational magic of this country and the foundational and, magic of demons and the man who wrote it is ashcroft's ancestor and he is also the founder of all five of the libraries 
Right. He's the one who created them. So she opens this book, starts trying to figure out the cipher, and then she's transported yeah, to another dimension. It's, it's one of those where the page, the words on the page don't stay stationary. They move. Right. You can't just so open you up the book and read it. So even if you do get like two paragraphs and they may not be continuous paragraphs or even from the same page of the book, they could be from different ends of the book. So you have to like study this book and like try and decipher Almost what's meditate at. on yeah. the book. And she's like, I feel like I'm going to go sleep. And then she is transported mm-hmm. yeah. somewhere else. And, and she meets the writer of this book. Yes. Who, the cipher is not in the book. He, he is, is the, the book. Cipher. <laughs> his 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 consciousness, as it were, his spirit yes. is in this book, and Holding she's the first person. This information. She is the first person who's been able to get to him. Right. And he's like, whatever. He's you, shocked. Yeah. He's like, whatever you want, I'm not giving it to you. She's like, I don't know. But she tells him, she's like, you have to tell me what is in this book, or else Ashcroft is going to get it. Because right. he's studying this book, and he completely dismisses her. Again, uh, he doesn't believe her. Mm-hmm. And then in the process, before she can, you know, really go at him again, something starts happening to the book. Yeah. And she realizes she has to get out, find out what's happening to the book, because the world almost starts to collapse in and on itself. Yeah. And when she comes back to herself, she realizes a candle's fallen over. Yeah. She spilled wax on the book. And so she has, has to, like... It, it made oh, we'll it mad. It. Yeah. And so it starts turning into a monster. So she has to get Nathaniel to help her turn it back into a book. <laughs> right. Which, Which previously they weren't sure was possible. Yeah. But they make it happen somehow. Yeah. And that's the moment Nathaniel's like, you're crazy. I'm going to help you. But yeah, crazy. he decides to help her. Because <laughs> I think he says something about how she he can't let her keep destroying any more antiques. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I, I love his sarcasm and snark and snark. It was very uh Captain Jack Harkness. To it me. was I loved it. But I what loved I liked it. about it was it was it was infused with enough of his grittiness and dark backstory that it felt yes. authentic and it felt like a person who's been through things trying to push people away with humor and sarcasm yeah, as was... opposed to just like that bad boy being sarcastic like it was never cringy yeah it was like he had his sarcasm but then he also had his sarcasm with elizabeth which was affectionate well and there was also a sarcasm that was very much like emotional based on his own con- yeah i mean I think she used that medium well to it was show perfect. his emotions and thoughts. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was very, because really that's when, yeah, I mean, she just endears you to him so well. Yeah. If, if you hated him in the this, beginning, which I don't know how yeah. you could, you mm-hmm. would love him. By this the is time the character who you. uses the term menace as a term of affection. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So things start moving very, very quickly from this point, which I love because confession, (laughs) I read this book super procrastinated. Um, So um, I remember how I told you like Friday, I was maybe on chapter six or chapter eight. And then literally like, I'm just like, okay, well, I'm going to sit down and read a couple, try and get halfway through the book after my girls go to sleep. And then I text you the next day. I'm like, so I finished the book last night. (laughs) I'm like, I wasn't even 100 pages in. And then I'd suddenly finished the book. It was one of those, it's 1.30 in the morning and I have no sleep, but I don't need sleep. I need answers. (laughs) Which that has not happened to me in a long time. Yeah. It, 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 It was, gosh, it was like I had my old reading spark back from when I was a teenager. When I would just, like, devour two books and, you know, I would devour two books in, like, four days. I had a similar experience with it. Um, But, yeah, I loved it. Yeah. It moved very, very quickly once you got to one point. And um, what was the last book that did that for you? The last book that did that for me? Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. I think the last book that I read in 24 hours 
which this one pretty much was a book that I had read from cover to cover in 24 hours, was probably, oh, what was the name of it? It was the last, it was the third um, Shades of London book by Maureen Johnson. The Shadow oh, cool. Cabinet. The Shadow gotcha. Cabinet. Yeah. That was the last one that I read writer. in 24 hours. That was the last one I read in 24 hours. Well, that's awesome. I love books like that. What was the last book that did that for you, where you read it in 24 hours? Because you just couldn't stop. Not because you had yeah. to. It was probably No Exit by Taylor Adams. It's a thriller. Really? The whole book takes place over 12 hours. Ooh. And I was gonna watch a movie and do something else that night and I did none of it I read that book <laughs> until about four in the morning <laughs> yeah it's that was 2019 just... but that's mm. been, that was a good one yeah yeah shadow cabinet was 2019 and then now that this podcast is friends with Maureen Johnson on Twitter hello Maureen Johnson um <laughs> I've been bugging her constantly about when's the fourth one coming out oh when's the fourth one coming out when's the fourth one coming out What's the fourth one coming out? Because she got a new puppy. And my immediate response was like, you know who you should give a puppy? <laughs> Stephen Rory. <laughs> Hopefully she'll watch this. Hi, Maureen Johnson. Hi, Maureen Johnson. We love see you. see how much you need the next book. Yeah. Really, really, really so, badly. Oh, no. Maureen, she hasn't read Hand on the Wall. Hey, I'm getting there. <laughs> She I got a puppy. I had twin babies. Things got in the I way. I guess that's the reason. <laughs> But I, yeah, because like even when we did uh, the vanishing, st- when we buddy read the vanishing stare, I think we read that in like three days, mm-hmm. and that was because I had to stop to work. <laughs> yeah. Oh goodness, but yeah. So anyway, it starts picking up pretty quickly from here. Yeah, very quickly. Um, yes, very quickly indeed. Uh, we learn more about Nathaniel's nightmares, what they're of, and what his father did. Right. His family has been known for necromancy for a long time. In fact, one of the reasons why they're so well known is that centuries ago during a war with this country, their family's power was essentially the only reason why the country won that war. Yeah, because Um, it doesn't matter if a soldier dies, if you can bring them back and you can't kill them. Right. So their family is kind of like the, the... Weapon of mass destruction deterrent for he's he's the nuclear bomb, right? So you know, um, there's a lot of pressure on him in society to continue this line, but also a lot of prejudice and stigma that he has to deal with because of his ancestors' Mm -hmm. actions, and not everyone has smiled kindly upon the family who brings back people from the dead. No, including certain members of that family <laughs> right namely that his so nathaniel when he was young he was 12 mm-hmm. i think 12 12, he was 12. Um, his mother and younger brother die in an accident and his Tragically. father stricken by grief mm-hmm. decides to resurrect them even though he knows they won't be them you know yeah. but, but he um, sees it as a chance in the to get his of... wife and son back Exactly. He's distraught. You know, he's not yeah. thinking. But in the middle of the ritual, which Silas is helping him with, mm-hmm. um, and Silas knows that the magic in the room will kill him, will kill the dad mm-hmm. just but by he being... he finds his, out Nathaniel's sees, in the room as well. Exactly. And so he kills the dad to stop to the ritual. To save Nathaniel. To save Nathaniel. And that is what Nathaniel witnessed at 12, which is why he keeps having these these and dreams about but we learn how close that, silas and yeah between nathaniel that and are. the deal silas and nathaniel struck after that are why nathaniel has that white streak of hair mm-hmm. yeah so it's exactly. like it's not there just for like it's essentially like it has a right reason. it's a demon mark that he's yeah. made a bargain yeah um and so we learn about this mm-hmm. and she has the book And they're trying to figure out a way for her to get multiple people inside the book to try to get this secret. And just while they're doing this, right. Um, Isn't this when Ashcroft shows up and attacks them? He's, no, he's in, she's, after she gets the book, she still goes back to work at the library. 
Right. To prove that, like, it wasn't her. And so Ashcroft shows up one day and doesn't Mm -hmm. recognize her. And she overhears him talking with the director. And the director is like, well, you know, this is the third library that's been struck. This book is gone. Uh Uh-huh. And it's the book that she took. Yeah. And And it's also the book that he was looking for. And so now she knows she's off the hook because they're attributing it to the saboteur. Mm Mm-hmm. And so she knows that this library was not targeted, but they know that the Harrow's library, which is the last one, which is the one that holds all the class 10s and above, is the last one to target. And they know that if that is targeted and a grimoire is awoken, it will be a bloodbath. (laughs) So they're trying to figure out how to stop Ashcroft and whatever he's doing and preventing him from striking this library and they're also talking about it with Katrin and Katrin is like basically they're like there's no way to expose him right unless we do it we hit him where it hurts Mm -hmm. his image yeah so they decide to make a public accusation there is a royal ball right because even if nobody believes Elizabeth it's gonna make one damn good story in the papers right (laughs) They, they think that there are enough suspicious moments with mm-hmm. Ashcroft that if they bring this to light, a few people will maybe not throw it out the window immediately. Yeah, because Hi- he Ashcroft told High Society that, you know, she was at this one ball. They all met her. They're like, well, she seems nice, but a bit odd. And then they're like, oh, she's lost her marbles. Right. And he told everyone she was everyone. in the insane asylum. And then she shows up on the arm of Nathaniel Thorne, the kingdom's most eligible bachelor, dressed yeah. in silver and gold finery. Who, by the way, has never brought a woman to a ball in the history Ever. of his life. Ever. So that in itself a is a big deal. news. Yeah. yeah. And, um, which is something we need to talk about before we get into like the nitty gritty meat of this scene. But they, from across the room, they glimpse the prince of the kingdom. Oh, yeah. And Nathaniel says, I used to fancy him, but then I realized that, you know, we just weren't compatible. And I'm, I'm sitting here going, oh, my boy is bi. That's so I love lovely. so much. I love bi representation. I mean, like, first yes. of all, it's Pride Month. Happy Pride. Happy Pride. Um, End but of Pride, but still happy Pride. It's so rare to see male by representation like yes. that was huge and especially I love that it never came into question that like just because he's interested in a woman now is he still by like of yeah, course no. he is. I don't know I, that was beautiful well and also too it was lovely where he's just kind of like yeah I really used to have the hots for him and um you know Elizabeth so is just like I can see and, why he's cute right <laughs> so casual and accepted and yeah uh, and she's not really weirded out by it at all and beautiful moment yeah. even though he's with a woman now he's not suddenly straight he's still by right it's not <laughs> questioned and he's he's not ashamed or embarrassed in fact he kind of brags about it because the guy's yeah like, you know and i oh that moment alone for me made the book like five stars yeah, it would, and it was just so lovely, and it's like it meant a lot to me. Yeah, and it's and it's not even like a throwaway moment. It's no, not it's like something you put in there just for fun. And like you now that you now that he said something, you can go back through the book and be like, oh yeah, he is. <laughs> Understand? Like yeah, I just I love that because I think especially in um, YA books with a romance. Yeah. Um, the the men don't always get as emotionally explored as the women do. Yeah. Uh, sometimes well, they do. Yeah. But, well, I think that's normally because nine times out of ten, it's from the female's point of view. Right. But I think that's why I still appreciated it here. Because this was yes. from her point of view. And yet, we still were allowed inside of Nathaniel's world every once in a while. Yeah. And I really appreciated that. Yeah. It was so nice. Mm-hmm. And I think he even makes a comment where he's just kind of like, would have been made hard to make an heir, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he almost jokes about it. It's yeah. Very, it's very easy and well done and um, not forced. No. Well written. Again, it's, good job. It, again, that was a moment that reminded me of uh, Captain Jack Harkness from Doctor Who, where he's oh, just yeah. like, he's just like, I 
will or not Nathaniel, but Captain Jack Harkness is like, I if you have genitalia, I will sleep with you. <laughs> <laughs> and and he like makes no bones about it. But that was something that I really liked about Nathaniel, where he was just so open and honest about it. And Elizabeth wasn't like weirded out by it or upset by the fact that he might have been with a man before her. She's right. like I it, think that this is the beginning of well, I hope that these books are the beginning of how it should be in the world where yeah. we don't even have to talk about what a great moment this is or how yeah. she reacted. I'm so glad she, because how she reacted should be the bare minimum. Yeah, that's the bare minimum. And we need of to how stop rewarding react. people for that. But we're right now we're still in a space where we should reward people because we're still learning this, you know, but yeah, um, it was just kind of a beautiful glimpse into hopefully a future that's more like that. Because they didn't even stop to talk about it as much as we did. It was yeah. just a fact of the world. And also, too, and it's just along. so wonderful. To, like, it also shows his level of intimacy with Elizabeth. Because he felt comfortable sharing that with her. And he yeah. knew that she wouldn't be weird or anything about it. It was it was a very Definitely intimate moment for the two of them. Trust. Yeah. He doesn't seem to be all that um, worried about sharing it. But still... No. Uh, he's shown to not let people close to him. So oh. it is a moment of uh, him kind of offering her another glimpse into his world. Yeah, it was very, like. it was very intimate emotionally. And I really appreciated that. And I also, you know, I love me. I also, I also love any kind of like, I love books that have representation of all people. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Because the world is not strictly one group. <laughs> Yeah, I'm tired of reading about books that are just one kind of person. I know. You know? But, so, that was just a beautiful... Um, it was. It was a lovely moment. ...addition <laughs> to this book. Um, yeah. Good job, Rogerson. Yes. So, that moment passes at this ball, and Ashcroft kind of confronts them and is pleasant about it and asks them questions just to kind of try and see if Elizabeth remembers anything. Right, he doesn't know how much she knows Well, yeah. acting like that anyway. And so through this conversation, they wait till they have a crowd. And then come the accusations, especially of the mental hospital that he sent her to. And she's like, oh, after speaking to a doctor who barely spoke to me uh, for two sentences, who then had me declared insane after you planned all this at your place where you had me captive and had to ha plan to have me sent away. That So they basically bring up every suspicion they have. All and like not even about that, about the libraries, the, the libraries, libraries they make sure everyone hear them. Oh yeah. And like the society gets riled up. Because it's not like, just her talking, it's also Nathaniel. Who is trusted in their circles. Yes. He has a reputation. Yes. And it's one of those that it's like people start listening to her now, which it's really kind of unfortunate that the only reason these people listen to her is because now she has an authority on her arm. Right. But it is nice that he allow, like he uses he that authority to give her a platform. Yes. As, you know, um, like, it's sad that she had to have an authority to get people to listen to her, but it yeah. is nice that he recognizes the only way people are going to listen to you is if I give you a platform to do it on, and so here is your platform. <laughs> right, and I liked that he did that as opposed to being like, no, I must protect you, I will do this, I will. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. he was not was alpha male about so, it. so, like, like... He just, it was very much just that he didn't have the level of expertise on, that she no. did on the stuff she was working on. And he stepped in when he did have expertise. Yeah. And it was beautiful. And it was, it was so nice to see, like, in, especially in young adult books, where it's very much, oh, my gosh, everybody started a turf war over me. It's, right. you know, nine times out of ten. And this time he's just kind of like, there was no go on, baby, I'll hold your flower. Right. <laughs> there was just, like... You know, like in the beginning, I said I had this like false first impression of these yeah. characters that I thought were going to have this like cliche insta love romance. And yet it never turns into that because she's independent and he's independent and they have things they're worried about together. They also have things they're worried about separately. Yeah. And it never turns into this dramatic. It's, you know what it is? It's a real relationship. Right. It, it <laughs> felt very. Um, 
just that everyone was on equal footing. Yeah. And I like that. And he, he let her, in the scene, he let Elizabeth do most of the talking. And he only chimed in when he had to. Right. Because he's like, I'm going to let you go. I'll back you up if you need me. Mm-hmm. But you probably won't. <laughs> yeah. And that was enough. She definitely makes a spectacle, which Mm -hmm. uh, immediately all the reporters in the room rushed to put into the newspapers. Yes. Um, Because even though there's no hard evidence, it makes sense. It's a big story. It is. It's huge. So they think they've won a big victory for the night, and they head out. Well, they start to, and Elizabeth basically has a panic attack because she had to face her captor. Yeah. And Nathaniel talks her through it. He's a support for her. Yeah. Which also, that scene was done beautifully. Yeah. Especially if you're somebody who has had a panic attack or two. (laughs) And then they realize they can't find Silas. (laughs) Right. And then they realize he's missing. Mm Mm-hmm. So, long story short, Ashcroft has kidnapped Silas, and he basically tells Nathaniel, give me the girl, or you'll lose your demon. And this is really a very long-awaited culmination of Nathan's conflict from the beginning. Yeah. Like how much is is what his family worth to him over what he wants to be? Yeah. You know? But And yet, Silas is also his only family left. And so, yeah, yeah this is a big moment. Um, Silas is very heavily weakened by being Yeah, because he's in iron shackles. Which mm-hmm. is hard, bad for demons. But a fight and, breaks out. Because, yes, and Elizabeth um, luckily Elizabeth had her sword under her dress. Sword. <sighs> and um, during this fight, things seem like they're going well for a while. And then mm-hmm. as things do, they go wrong very suddenly. Which, and good lord, can we talk them. about one second? Just one second. Can we spare a thought? For hot wizard boyfriend fighting with a green whip made of magic fire. Yeah, that was pretty cool. That is a really nice weapon. It's yeah. a very attractive weapon. <laughs> He's a very attractive weapon. He is. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 very he does have a little bit of the uh he does have a little bit of Indiana Jones in him, which yeah. as you and I both know Young, hot Harrison Ford with a whip is very hard to resist for the oh, prepubescent yeah. girl. <laughs> she was my first crush, man. Yes, I not not Harrison Ford, Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones, of Yes, course. yes. How yeah. can you look at Indiana Jones and not be attracted to him? <laughs> oh. <laughs> but yeah, so um, in this moment, Ashcroft has an opening. He tries to kill Nathaniel, and Silas jumps in the way and sacrifices himself. Yeah. Um, to save Silas Nathaniel. is banished. And Elizabeth, again, is faced with a choice. Get help for Nathaniel and hope he lives. Or chase Ashcroft and bring the person who killed the director to justice. Mm-hmm. And she saves Nathaniel. This time she goes for help. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's kind of a mirrored situation, like showing her... Yeah for growth and I don't know I liked that yeah. but um yeah she gets help for Nathaniel yes barely and like all bad home. boys uh which his wards the magic of his house right um him. so in this world uh old houses are covered in gargoyles and all these different kinds of wards that protect them from magical attack and all these different yes. things but they only recognize family members and they only let in family members or those who are approved essentially which the house responds to Elizabeth. Well, yeah, I was getting to that. Yeah. Because, um, <laughs> Nathaniel is unconscious from his wounds, and the physician doesn't know how to get into the house. And lo and behold, all of a sudden, the house opens up for Elizabeth. So they go inside. Thankfully, Nathaniel's going to live. Um, yeah. It's very touch and go, but sorcerers it's, heal very it's quickly. It's very. With the wards in this it's world. also very the bad boy trope of I'm injured. I don't need to stay in bed. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, So after a night or two of rest, um, he sends away the doctors and decides we're summoning Silas. Decides he's going to get Silas back. 
Because he's weak. He's weak. He's very, very, very weak, and especially like being cut off from his demon. But he's like, I'm going to spend the last of my magic and probably the last of my strength to summon Silas back. And through this, Elizabeth learns Silas's true name, which is very powerful. Which is also a big deal because, again, in this world, yes. names are only passed down through families and no one else has heard these demon names, which is how these families consolidate yeah. and keep their power. So, so the fact that... Name, it's a big deal. Yeah, yeah, the fact that Nathaniel spoke Silas's true name and Elizabeth's presence is a huge sign of trust from him. Hmm. And... They summon Silas. And Silas is like... You know, they see a little bit more of the demon in Silas this time. And he's like, I want 30 years. And, you know, he's like 25. And then Elizabeth is he like, you've never seen. Yeah. 20, the first time with Nathaniel. Yeah. Nathaniel offers 25, but he doesn't think he can offer 30 because he's so wounded. That yeah. Elizabeth and, he's, and Nathaniel think that that will kill him. Yeah. And so Elizabeth, in order to spare Nathaniel pain, offers 10 years of her life. To Silas, because she's like, you've told me yourself, you have never seen a life like mine before. Right. We've, at this point, established that possibly because she grew up in the library for so long, Mm -hmm. she's resistant to a lot of different forms of magic. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, Katrin has suggested this. Where, where she has been doing research. And we also find out that, like, what we've seen in the book is also not the first time Elizabeth has necessarily survived something she should have. Uh, but right. they were talking about, like, the book lice that lives in the library. They get especially resilient because they grow around these grimoires, which have their own kind of residual magic. Right, and, and dust and things in the air that they... Yeah, they breathe it in. And it's... Years. Yeah, and it's part of that magic becomes a part of them. Right. And so, so she suggests... I think you're a lice. Yeah, I think yeah, you're a book lice. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she thinks the re- that's And that explains why Elizabeth is so tough and so tall and resistant to magic. And, and because she grew things. up in the library. And by the time that the apprentices get there at... 13, 14, they're already mostly developed, but Elizabeth developed in the library. Mm-hmm. From a baby. Yeah. So it gives her this unique circumstances. Yeah, but it's I- almost like she has a connection to the grimoires because she grew up around grimoire magic. Right. So during this exchange, she offers Silas that in exchange, in addition to the original bargain he had with Nathaniel, she will offer 10 years of her life because she knows it's special. She knows he wants yeah. it. And she also just doesn't want Nathaniel to die. Yeah. And, and Silas takes it. He accepts. So all of a sudden we see his demon form sort of revert back inside. Fascinating. Yes. Fascinating. Yes. Um, and he's here again to serve the family and to help them on this. Yeah. Mission. And um, Elizabeth now has a demon mark of her own. Because she made a deal. Yes, she does. Yeah, which um, she's not sure how she's going to deal with, given that she grew up in a culture where that is basically that seen as no like go. being a traitor. <laughs> Consorting with demons was definitely something you were not allowed to do. I mean, she's carrying a sword named Demon Slayer. Right. Exactly. <laughs> this is not... This streak of silver, this is not okay for her. Yeah, no, definitely not. <laughs> but this is her situation now. And now they have a very serious problem because Ashcroft, um, he's trying to figure out how to get inside the book. He knows now that Elizabeth... Oh, yes. It. He knows Elizabeth can get in the book. Mm-hmm. And so and, he's like, it's only a matter of time. So he turns to drastic measures, but we don't know what those are. And then one night, Elizabeth is like, something is happening to the book. We have to go in there. And without right. thinking... She takes Nathaniel with her. Right, which is the first time that's happened. She's never been able yeah. to go this far. Um, but all of a sudden, they're inside the grimoire, and Pendergast, who is the writer of the book, is inside, yes. and he's been tortured, and the right. reality is essentially burning. 
Yes. And um, so she's like, you have to tell me the secret. It doesn't matter now. Ashcroft has it. You have to tell me what the secret is so we can stop him. Right. This reality is dissolving as they speak. Yeah. And she's like, everything you built this for is over unless you tell me what you're trying to do. So he tells her. Which <sighs> turns out the great libraries were not With, always. Remember, anti magic. Anti magic, anti demon, very. We are here to protect secrets and keep sorcerers in check. Yeah. And then they find yeah. out that they were built to be a ritual circle for a yes. gigantic magical working. In yes. A they were meant to be a summoning circle for a massively powerful demon. Right. They call it an archon, which essentially, like, you know, we were talking about the classes of demons earlier. There's, like, imps and goblins, and then the, like, lower demons, which, like, the middle and lower class can summon. And then there's the highborn demons, which are all the nobility. And then their bosses are archons. And yes. They're like kings. been one on Earth. No. And um, Ashcroft plans to summon one using... The libraries of all things. Yes. So he and the way that they do this is by setting off a grimoire and killing it. That is the blood sacrifice needed. That's their candle for their summoning circle. And so all he has to do is hit the fourth library and then the royal library, which is in the center, which is where they are. Which is the library she works at now. Yeah, which is the library she works at now will be the center of the circle where this big king demon appears. Right. And so... so now at least they uh, know what they're dealing with. Yes. Basically, so basically, if Ashcross summons this demon, it's the apocalypse. Yeah. The kingdom will be destroyed because the no matter what the size of the summoning circle, there will be no deal that he could make to bind this demon right. to him. But Ashcroft thinks he can bind this demon and use it for progress. Yep. <sighs> Pride goeth before the fall. Mm-hmm. Well, there was an um, old movie with uh, Keanu Reeves. I believe it's called The De Devil's Advocate. And at the, end, at the end, the devil is like, Pride's my favorite sin. <laughs> well, it is like what they call it, like the, the king of the seven deadly sins. Like... It's, mm -hmm. it's the worst one. <laughs> yeah, you got to watch out for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so basically, Pendergast is like, here, take this vial. It will transport you to the Harrows, which I know is where he's going. Yeah. And they don't know how Ashcroft is going to strike, but they know he is. They don't know if he has an inside person at every library. They don't know if he goes there himself and sets off these things. Right. They they're, don't know, but they get there and they well do their best. Not well -informed. Yes, they get there and they try to inform the, inform the director there. And he's like, you both bear demon marks. We can't tell. And it's like, oh, it's yeah. one of those things that like the news from the city has not reached them that Ashcroft is a traitor. So they're right, like, so why the would you? doesn't know. And here's two people with demon yeah. marks walking into a library saying, blaming you should the... help us. Yes, yeah, blaming not about the that. head of the sorcery organization for basically treason. <laughs> and he's like, I have no reason to believe you and or trust you. And so they get thrown into jail. And uh, one of my favorite lines was they were sitting there talking about it. They're like, you, this is terrible waiting for Silas to come get us. And they're like, uh, do you think Silas will be long? And Silas is just kind of like, no, I haven't lost my touch. <laughs> yeah, he always just miraculously shows up. I, just showing yeah. up without anyone noticing. I adore <laughs> Silas. I really, yeah, I was very, very endeared to him by the yes. end. Yes, yeah, he he's um, one of those characters that like if he was trapped and he and they need to like throw knives at like the thing to let him out, he'd just be he'd be the character that just keeps pulling knives out of everywhere. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so they come out and they, out. and so they get there 
and they follow the director and they discover that Ashcroft has been entering the minds of the directors of the library and using them. Like he's basically been controlling their minds to attack the libraries. So Elizabeth realizes that's what he did with her director. And that basically is forcing the people who care about the library the most to sabotage their own library. Uh-huh. Yeah. Which is just another kind of level of betrayal. And Right, but I also maybe it's just because it's 2020 and I'm not gonna get too political. Mm-hmm. But the idea of a villain instead doing his own dirty work, not by like having a henchman or whatever, but like by insidiously inserting ideas and thoughts into people's minds that were fearful and hateful and <sighs> terrified. Like that really re- yeah. like that really resonated with me because I feel like it's perfect kind of- for the time. Right. So it's perfect. Because the idea of somebody very- taking away the idea of somebody taking away your control, your ideas, your free will. Your agency. To, yeah, someone taking away your agency to serve their purpose is one of the most insidious things I can think of right now. Right, right. Especially and, forcing you to do something that goes against everything you've ever stood for and believe in. Right. So, yeah, I feel like the, the methods he used, I don't know if the author meant to do that or if it's just resonating me because of, you know, when I'm reading it. Mm-hmm. But um, I just, I really felt invested in hating this villain because I was like, how dare you? Like, And he's also willing to destroy the world with the claim to help it progress. Right. Because he was the only, he was the only person who knew better. Right. And like, I also kind of like that, like, again, not to get too political, but like, (laughs) we have such a, um, And and fixing his image in the media. Right. And we have such a pandemic, I think, of well-off people in politics who claim that they can fix everything Mm -hmm. and that they have the answers and that's the solution and they can fix it. And And because they're high enough in society, some people don't question it. Well, right. Plus they, you know, they have all these different influences, but, but I just really liked that. um, That was part of this whole thing was that not only did he believe what he was not only did he practice what he preached, but he believed he was right. Like, yeah. he didn't think he was the villain. I, <laughs> and I always like that in a villain. Yeah, to quote Tom Hiddleston, every villain is a hero in their own mind. Right. And, and he's, always... he very much sees himself as the hero. And, like, in some books, you, you understand, like, a villain's motivations. But in this book, you understand that Ashcroft sees this as his birthright. And it's how he's going to save the world. Right, like it wasn't even that we saw his motivations. It was almost that we saw his motivations and we also got an insight into like his entire psychology. It was, yeah. like, and it was never told. It was all shown. Yes. Beautiful. I just, yeah, I can't praise her for that because Gorgeous. it was a complex villain without ever um, yes. making any of those ridiculous villain and I mean, like, mistakes. Goodness, this book. Used tropes, but used them well and had explanations for the tropes. Had well-rounded both of the romantic characters and even the side characters. Right. And even had a really, really complex villain that we could all still understand. Mm-hmm. That, and, and that's such a hard thing to do. Right. I love that. And I love that not only did she take tropes and find creative ways to use them, but there are some she even just like subverted entirely and I love that she did that because the beginning of the book makes you think she's not going to do that. No, no. And, and you're, you're everybody is so, everyone is so deep as a character. Everyone that we focus on is so deep as a character and everybody kind of has a little bit of a story arc and the world is just, so, is done so beautifully. Like There's a, lot of a, a lot of her exposition on the world is not necessarily told through exposition. Exactly. Um, and it's so good. Um, I love it like, so much. It, because it when, felt natural. Which, like, what I was yeah. talking earlier about how I like how she expanded from the one library to the world. I think that's one way she did. She made that feel so natural. Learning about the world was because yeah. about it in these, like, 
you know, like a microcosm and then the macrocosm. And, well, it, it, and it, it also it, mirrors what Elizabeth did because she went from the microcosm of her library to the macrocosm of the whole kingdom. Right. That's a good point. It like mirrors her journey. The journey the reader takes mirrors the journey that she takes. And, and I feel like that gave it such this natural, authentic flow. Yeah. It, yeah. Oh my I gosh. Never, this... I never stopped my, like after the first couple chapters, I never stopped and went like, what? Yeah, no, I never did. You know? And great, even in the so. first couple of chapters, I never stopped and went, what? I did occasionally because I was foreseeing, I was assuming she was going to go for some tropes that I'm not a fan of. Yeah. But she didn't. So that's my bad. Um, <laughs> but, but. And yeah, like everybody, even like some of the minor characters, like Mercy comes back at the end and they get, and like, especially Katrin gets and a like hero her. moment. Right, I liked that both of them had things they were working on that yeah. were theirs, even though they were side characters and we didn't necessarily witness it all. Like, it wasn't all about Elizabeth's work. Yeah. Like, multiple people contributed to this, whether or not we saw it happening. And I liked that feel. Yeah. yeah. Even yeah. some of the nobility we weren't a fan of that we saw in the parties mm -hmm. all got a little bit of an emotional arc as well. And right, I'm, some it, bad. It made some everybody... Bad. Yeah, it made everybody very real and very human. Right. Everything felt very natural, which for a fantasy is not always easy. Yeah. Um, like, I just, goodness, I just remember that Four Winds, One Storm book that I read. And so much of the world had to be told through exposition because it was so different. Right. Than our and world. I think so much... I, I wouldn't be surprised if this is one of those books where when she wrote it, it was a lot longer mm -hmm. and her editing was cutting back because this book was so sharp and clean it was. and well plotted that I just feel like she really took time to write yeah. and cut. And I feel like she and probably and wrote a much, much bigger universe. And then, and then cut, cut a lot back. of it out. But even and what she knew of the universe, people. even if it wasn't in the book, right. you still got the idea of it. Right. And so you got the essential feeling and the essential vibe and the look and and the things that mattered to people. But you didn't necessarily like need all the extraneous details that exactly she have like had you her mind. very quickly got the idea that sorcery was very much of a nobility kind of a thing, especially when she talked about like the about balls it. and the people they talked with and um, just the way the houses were and the neighborhood was you you really got that feel. Yeah. And then and I love that everything <sighs> had like everything had a moral angle and a social angle and a practical yeah. angle and like a realistic angle. Like nothing was ever like, this is good and this is evil and this is black and this is white. It yeah. was very much like a book of reality. Well, Elizabeth, it's not about reality. Elizabeth came into this book, starts this book with a very black and white view. She and then as things dream. go on, she, well, she lands in the gray a lot. Who basically is like, gray personified well yeah because she talks about he makes jokes about bathing in the blood of virgins because he knows that's what librarians are told and he's like no we don't do that right <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness okay but we got off track yes, where we're we, got off um, we have to get um, to the end of this book so they harrows attacked and they've re-summoned silas and now they're at they're at the Harrows yes. right now and they've discovered that ashcroft is using mind control and then we got off on a tangent about Yes. So the they're at the final library, the Harrows, which only holds 10 and above grimoires, which... And uh, as soon as they get in there, they're like, Elizabeth, hello. <laughs> right. But and they they get there and they realize what's going on. Just but, in the nick of time. Yeah, just in the nick of time and they try and stop it, but they can't and they're too late. Mm -hmm. And the director is killed. Yes, one and of the grimoires is turned into a malefict and becomes a killing machine. Yeah, and so they're forced to choose, do we kill this malefict, which will complete the circle, yep. and let them summon demons, or do we not kill it and let countless other people die? It's a tense <laughs> moment. It is. It's a very tense moment. 
And so, and this is also something that I really appreciate about the book. Nathaniel lets Elizabeth make the decision. Because, because as much as he was there to help her, this isn't his mission. No, it's not. It's hers. Right. And I love that, like, like it would have been okay if it was theirs, but I loved that it was hers because it was never co-opted. No. Taken over. I mean, it was just, this is what she set out to do and by God, she was going to finish it. Yeah. And also too, she is the librarian. Right. He's and like, he this is that. your Her territory. This is Trump's. not mine. Right. What do that we do? Great. And she makes the decision to kill it. And the people at the library blame Nathaniel because, you know, sorcerer, book goes postal. Yeah, they're the only all person who could do that as a sorcerer. They're like, it's him. And she's like, no, 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 he's fine. <laughs> I promise he's fine. And so to take it down, he gets a hold of the head of the thing, uses Pendergast slash vial, and teleports, essentially separating the head from the monster and landing it in the middle of high noon tea at a noble's house. Yeah. (laughs) Which I'm like, excellent decision. I really (laughs) thought that was a stylistic touch. Yeah. I I enjoyed it. I like that. Good job, Nathaniel. I like the style. Yeah, I also liked that, like, the house guard was like, you're going to come with me. And Elizabeth is like, this is blood, and puts it in the umbrella stand. (laughs) Like, by the end of this book, I just liked that they're both so, like, unfazed, because they just threw it. (laughs) And they're, like, covered in blood, and they've already been fighting a battle that they know they probably cannot win. And they're just like, "Mm." The Malefic is dead, but they've turned this library against them. Um, They've also somewhat completed this circle that they've been trying to stop. Yeah. And so now they realize they have to stop Ashcroft in the Royal Library and they get out in the street and they realize imps and fiends are running rampant in the streets. Yeah, and so everyone. this is the big Avengers superhero battle scene mm-hmm. where they're just like this is a piece of cake right now. So Elizabeth wields Demon Slayer. Nathaniel has his green whip of magic with Silas at his side. And it's just, they just go hog wild. They kill some monsters. Yeah. Let the monster slaying be. I remember you texted me, you're like, I'm on chapter 35. And I texted you back, let the monster slaying begin. (laughs) There was lots of monster slaying. Lots of monster slaying. It was great. Yes. It was great monster slang. It was. <laughs> <clears throat> but they get in to the Royal Library using Elizabeth's key from being a maid. And they're like, we have to find Ashcroft. And so Elizabeth starts using her connections with grimoires and with the library and asks them for help. And it opens up a tunnel for her and it lets her out in the restricted section. And she's like, she why? Wonders- why it let them out there as opposed there. to where Ashcroft is, right? And then she realizes the library is saying, we want to fight back. Right. The library <laughs> wants her to let them out. Yes. So they can fight too. Let us out. And one of my greatest pleasures was <laughs> that she did. Yeah. Um, that's what she does. And yeah, and so she just starts breaking all chains. all sorts of different magical properties and horrific and amazing and wonderful and terrible attributes start coming to life. Yeah. To protect this. This home. This home. That they live in. Yeah. It's like, okay, like if you love books, this is one of those moments where like your inner child is just like, oh, I watched this, Matilda. And also this too, I'm like. Sequel. I'm like, if this is ever made into a movie, which I doubt it will, but But this would be a very cinematic scene. Yes, this scene is. Yes, lots of CGI. (laughs) Lots and lots and lots and lots of CGI. Um, Yeah. So whenever they make this movie, it has to have a good budget. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But if they ever, like, this is the moment where I'm like, this would have, like, the big swelling orchestra music as they're going from breaking changes and there's just books fluttering everywhere and the two lovers standing in the middle it's it's the big and they're ready prepping for battle scene it's the suit up scene 
at battle. The books yeah. just start going. They do. They start going. And they go to find Ashcroft. And he's like, you don't understand what I'm trying to do for this kingdom. Right. Once I have it. Peace. Yeah. Once I try to save this and do it. And Ashcroft, like, you see this thing coming. And it is made. And Elizabeth tells him, she's like, you're not going to be able to bind this thing, no matter what you do. Right. And he's like, the only way you're going to stop me is killing me. Are you going to kill me, girl? And she's like, if that's what it takes, I will. Yeah. And it's Nathaniel is out of power. Silas can't do much. It's, you know, they've been Basically, fighting all day. There's, down. Yeah, there's nothing else they can really do. And in the end, Elizabeth ends up... You know, Ashcroft is about to be killed by this demon that he summoned. Major, major, major crazy king of hell demon. Which would then set that demon free on the world. Yeah, and Elizabeth saves him mm-hmm. after everything he's done. And he's like, why? Why did you save me? And she's like, because I wanted to see the look on your face when you realized you were wrong. Yeah, it was a very Captain Marvel moment. That it was. It was. And um, her whole mission up until this point in the book is to get revenge for the person who killed the director. And now she's like, you will face justice. But we have to stop this thing first. And they can't figure out how to do it. And she looks at Silas and Silas is like... Remember something. Yeah, well, she looks at Silas and Silas tells her, you know, he's like, I thought it would be better for you and Nathaniel to die fighting side by side. <laughs> Because he knew they couldn't beat it. Right. And so Elizabeth realizes that Silas is bound to her now as much as he is bound to Nathaniel. Because of the bargain earlier in the book. Yes. And he remembers another simple fact about demons, which is that they can be set free. Yeah. And she, in a last ditch effort, she doesn't know it'll work. And it's a huge risk. And he might kill her. Yeah, he might. But she also understands that she believes that Silas is more than just a demon. Because she has seen the love that Silas has for Nathaniel since he's raised Nathaniel from a baby. Right. She was she's like, that humans didn't even have those emotions. Yeah. And she's like, I've been wrong about everything else. Who's to say I'm not wrong about this? And she right. releases him. And all it takes, she frees him. Whole situation. And he's like, I'm going to destroy everything. And all it takes is like Nathaniel saying his name like twice. And then he's like, I can't beat him, but I can push him back. (laughs) And Silas saves them all. Yeah, he beats the Archon um, back into the other world, which is where they summoned it from. So that it can't continue its rampage you know yeah silas so they can feel the red too yeah mm-hmm. and yeah and silas is gone and then the epilogue we get is right that ends the book and we get yeah. an epilogue which yeah is that ends epilogue. the book it's a fantastic epilogue elizabeth is offered to be reinstated as an apprentice in the library the royal and the library. royal library uh, Katrin has Katrin been transferred, transferred so she can the Royal Library. Library. And we also found out that Katrin exposed the director of Summerhall because he was smuggling grimoires out of the library to people for money. Yeah, so Katrin's career is going great. Yes, There's fantastic. Also this, like, wow. um, what's his name? Parcival? That yeah. totally has a crush on Katrin. Yeah, and Elizabeth <laughs> tells him, she's like, he's nice but gullible. Be easy on him. She's right. like, she's like, I will get him into too much trouble. And um, Nathaniel is doing well. Yes. Um, he's he, healed. He's, he's doing healed. better. He's having trouble being cut off from his magic because and he doesn't have a demon. from Silas, right. And from Silas. Um, but he's also, he's like, there's so much to do. I could take a knitting. <laughs> so he's sort of rediscovering not only the world, but also because of all this growth, he's sort of rediscovering who he is without some of the baggage yeah. he was carrying before. Yeah, and um, he's like, there are people who say, really I'm still planning to run for collegiate and 
Right. He's like, no. And he really and Elizabeth like, are together. Yeah. 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 He and Elizabeth are together. And Elizabeth takes the apprentice key, but and she says, I don't know if being a warden is what I want anymore. Right. In the beginning of the story, it was all she'd ever dreamed of. All she'd ever dreamed of, all she'd ever wanted to work towards. And now she tells the director just that she still wants to work here and train and maybe that's what she wants to do but that she says the world is so much bigger than I thought it was and she wants yeah. to see more of it um, so, which I also loved as an ending yeah. revolution yeah but, then because, the last... but she still has the key so she can still come back home right but you also realize that it is also expressed that Nathaniel and Elizabeth have been trying to summon Silas back Right, but they can't. they can't. They've been using, you know, his demon name his and they can't name, summon yeah. him back. And then um, I think it's in the middle of the night and she has just an idea. She has a little thought. Like, it may not work, but maybe she's ridiculous. Yeah, because it we'll says that, out. like, every time they've said his name, the candles haven't done anything. There wasn't even a wisp of a breeze or anything like that. And she's, like, she goes downstairs and she's, like, every time we've tried to summon him, we've used his demon name his true demon name but what we saw in the library what when he saved us all he's not that demon anymore he can't be so and she's like maybe that name has no connection to him anymore and so she goes down to the summoning circle and calls him silas she the name that daniel gave him silas. yeah and then the last <laughs> sentence we get is the candles blew out uh-huh. So I loved the last image. Yes, because it's so also good. it's wonderful because it's like it's a happy ever after. We get a little bit of an answer, but it's not a definitive answer. Right. Enough of an answer that you're not mad, enough of a mystery that it's still good. Plus, yes. you could easily write a sequel. Easily. You can easily write a sequel with this. Or a and it's just... novel. I mean, the world is just oh. so big. And then the way she leaves it up. Yeah. I have oh. Other than the fact that if I had written this, I would have made them like 18 and 20, which really, yeah. given that it's YA. Which your kind of said, make them younger if it's YA, you know, well, it's one of those. I was going to say, like, given that it's YA, I'm not going to hold that against it. Yeah. No. So I have no complaints. Mm -mm. I mean, like this book, we've talked about it through the whole podcast, but it's like the characters are wonderful and have depth and roundness. And like we found out too, I told you everybody has an arc. Mercy, the girl who helped her escape from the insane asylum, right. was hired on as a servant in the Thorn household to get right. her out of there. And she was there for what, six pages? Like, and, and yeah. the author never forgot about her. No. That was very impressive. That was so, oh my gosh, it was nice. And also too, like and her teacher, her teacher that like had, that Elizabeth had like annoyed. He's like, she's been into mischief, but she would never do this. And is like defending her to the new director. Um, he's the one that sends her demon slayer in the book. So it's like all of these people have their own kind of like mini arcs and they're not forgotten, which is just, it's a sign of right. excellent writing because right. you still stick with the people in this world. And like even, the whole community kind of affected her and what happened. Yeah. It was really well done. It was very nuanced and not, never shoved in your face. Yeah. And all the characters never were, first. all the characters were very well rounded, especially the two main yes. leads, which normally in like a young adult, they're not necessarily, I feel like in most young adult novels, they're not necessarily quite this fleshed out. Not always, or you get the thing where one is and the other isn't. Yeah. You know. Um, like, you don't, but, like, I feel like even though this book is from Elizabeth's point of view, we still got a lot of Nathaniel's growth and development and characterization. And I feel like every character in this oh, book, so no matter good. how small, and even the villain had to yeah. be from beginning to end. So. Because it, you, you know, you and I both know as a writer, it is very difficult to write a good and convincing villain very hard to write a good and redemption and convincing redemption arc or any arc yeah let alone do it for every character in your book and have them all perfectly intertwined with no problem yeah especially if you have a lot of them yeah and I'm it's so hard. hard to learn how to introduce a larger world yeah to your reader without it being just chapters of exposition right and she did i mean she uh, there was no 
exposition. No, there wasn't. If there was, was like action, that if there was it. lengthy exposition, I didn't see it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you know, but it ha- there was exposition in there. There had to be. Well, sure, because I learned about the world, but I didn't know that I was learning at the time I was exactly. learning. I was reading an action. Oh my gosh. It was it was sneaky so exposition. Well done. It definitely makes me want to read her other book, even though it has a, like I know it's well liked, but I know it has yeah. mixed reviews. Well, you know, and, but... and also too her last book, didn't you say was like her first book? So it's like she was still maybe still was. trying to find her feet. Maybe so, you know. Um I I also am not sure what it's about. Maybe it was a topic thing. I don't know. But Mm -hmm. I really am impressed by her writing and most impressed by her developmental planning. Yes. Um, And I really want to check out what else she's read. I I have no complaints about this book. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Really. um, I've been in a book slump for a couple months. (laughs) Got you out of it. I powered through this today uh, because I had to for the podcast. (laughs) But... (laughs) If I hadn't, like, really enjoyed the book, it would have been a chore. And instead, it just flew by. Like Yeah, this so you're good. like, oh, my gosh, I'm so glad I have an excuse that I need to finish this book today. Right. It was so, I was so glad that, like, my only job today is to finish this. <laughs> yeah. This is the only thing I have to do today. Right. And then I, I ended I, up loving yeah. it. So. I will yeah. say the first hundred pages were kind of slow for me. Because, like you said, it's a young adult novel. I came in with young adult expectations. Yeah. And not necessarily good young adult expectations because I feel like my uh, expectations of this book early on were definitely colored by um, The Beautiful, which was the last young adult book that I read and I did not care for it. That was um, less in depth. Yeah. Um, and so, like, I came in this assuming I'm probably not going to like this book a whole lot and then I adore this book now I want to read it again to see what I missed right that's awesome (laughs) well I'm so glad you liked it because yes I knew when I recommended it I actually thought you would but I also knew that like I was worried like what if it's overhyped you know because I had really high expectations which is why the first hundred pages for me were also difficult yeah. Because I was like, oh, this is going to be insta love, Mary Sue, not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. But then within 100 pages, you're like, oh, no, never mind. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. So you just, you just have to get the first, through the first 100 pages. And I think she almost does that on purpose. You almost yes. underestimate the book. And like and the first, the first time she fights a monster, I feel like then later she's going to get that whole, oh, I can do this kind of attitude. But she never got that whole, I can totally fight this monster attitude. Right. Like, I was so thankful there was none of that, like, teenage, I, I'm the chosen one so I can just mm. do anything. And, like, I'm going to go off and do this because I'm amazing and I'm the protagonist. Yeah. Even though it doesn't make any sense for her to be doing that. No, no, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Everything made sense. Everything fit. Yeah. Man, this was such a satisfying and, and- yeah. No oh, and the thing, the thing that I forgot to mention when I was talking about, like, the first chapter of this book sets up the plot, the Book of Eyes, which is the one she was transporting, has the spell in it to teach people how to control other people's minds. Right. So it's like, and everything is connected. And I'm like, oh, mwah, yeah, it's, mwah. <laughs> it's a really, really well done book. Yeah, so... How many bottles would you give it? Out one to five. five. One right. to five. One being the lowest, five being the highest. Oh. I'm going to give it a 4.5. 4.5? See, the only 4.5 I have ever given was Good Omens. <laughs> well, I loved it. I have very few complaints, so I feel like I can't rate it much lower without having yeah. a reason. Um, I, yeah. Yeah. I'm giving it a four. Hey. Yeah, so that's a 4.25 average. That is more <laughs> than enough to get wasted. <laughs> nice job. So, yes, that has cheers. Been sorcery of Thor. <laughs> yeah, so we're telling you if you can power through the first hundred pages, it is well worth your time. So worth it. So worth it. So, um, 
Yes, Sorcery of Thorns. Definitely go read it if you can. It's Audible, Library, Bookstore, Amazon, wherever you can get it. It's been out for uh, about a year now, so it's pretty available. Sorcery of Thorns by Margaret Rogerson. Excellent. Highly rated by us. Um, I'm sure the review will end up on Story Eyed Reviews. So, uh, Allie, yeah. if you have anything you wish to plug. <laughs> yeah, you can find us at storyeyed.blog online. And we will be reviewing this book as well as a lot of others. We do giveaways and games and all sorts of other things. Um, so keep an eye out. And if you're interested in more, check us out there, too. Thanks for having me on the podcast. I you love- are more than welcome. Thank you for joining us. And um, so if you want to hear more book reviews from me and another feisty redhead, um, you can check out some of our other episodes at This Is Lit. We are on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You can also follow us at litliteraturepodcast.com. And uh, we do have a Patreon. Uh, Casey just got married this month and um i am trying to sleep train two babies so if you guys feel generous we would love to have you so we can keep making episodes like this um our next episode if all goes according to plan and the world is not destroyed uh will be july 15th and casey and i will be celebrating our two-year anniversary where we will be reading the fellowship of the ring (laughs) By J.R.R. Tolkien, one of of our personal favorites. Yes. So um, we will see you guys next time. Until then, be safe and be healthy. Cheers. Cheers. Link. Link. Thank you for listening to our podcast. For more information, visit us at litliteraturepodcast.com or check out our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram pages. And remember, too much work and no vacation deserves at least a small libation. Cheers. Cheers.